Hi, this is Catherine. This is Taking Tea with Catherine, and welcome to Tea and Mystery. The tea is Baker Street tea, which is a combination of black teas, including um, Lapsang Souchong. Uh, it's an Upton tea uh, blend, and I like Lapsang with other things, so this works. It gives it that slightly smoky feeling that you could probably associate with Sherlock Holmes without being overwhelming. And this is one of my two Sherlock Holmes mugs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got this one in the gift shop of the museum in what is now 221 B Baker Street, I guess. Um, and we're doing all this because I read a book related to mystery and it was related to Sherlock Holmes. I can buy... My cats are playing loudly over there. Uh, <laughs> I wish I could le learn how to like cut to them because it's so ridiculous. Um, <laughs> They're having a Reichenbach Falls moment over there. Anyway, um, so my, yeah, my goal is in November to read nonfiction, nonfiction November. I would like to also sneak in some cozy mysteries here and there, but I don't seem to be able to find the time to do so. So I try to fit in a nonfiction book about the mystery genre in some form or another. And I did so successfully this month with From Holmes to Sherlock by Matthias Bostrom translated from the Swedish. So this was printed in, uh, or published in 2017. It covers basically the period up to 2016. So very much up to date with the, the TV show Sherlock and Elementary and, um, except those shows are not on the air now. And the very last season probably hadn't aired yet of Sherlock, which I found disappointing, but I don't know. It just, I think it just took it in a direction. Whatever. So this is almost a biography about Sherlock Holmes, but it's really more about how it began, how he began as a character, someone who's so real that people write letters to him in 221 B Baker Street. And for years, I don't know about now, I'm not even sure if that bank is still there, but there was someone assigned from the bank, Abbey National, I think, bank, um, that used to receive letters to that address to Sherlock Holmes, and they used to write back to these people. <laughs> they used to get letters from all over the world. So he's like, a lot of people know he's not real, but it's just so hard to believe because his image has just been so such a mainstay over the years. So many people are familiar with Sherlock Holmes, even if they've never read anything of his or never watched any of the programs or seen a graphic novel or anything. Everybody kind of knows what he looks like. Even with a Benedict Cumberbatch Sherlock, you know, they put it in modern times, and yet even then at some point they incorporated the hat. <laughs> Again, the hat was not part of the image um, of Sherlock Holmes from the beginning. He wouldn't have worn that in London. He would wore, have worn it in the countryside. But it just became iconic to him. So, um, yeah, so obviously Sherlock Holmes has evolved in certain ways, has changed in certain ways, and sometimes has stayed stay the same. Conan Doyle envisioned him in a certain way, and it is pretty much still associated that way, even with shows like Sherlock and Elementary. Um, you still think of Victorian England, pretty much. Although I do believe that sh that Arthur Conan Doyle would not have been... I can't read his mind. But would he have minded that we make a modern-day version of Sherlock Holmes? Probably not, because at the time of his creation, he was modern-day. So it's just a matter of fitting it in. Which they do a pretty good job of, to be honest. Uh... So I liked, I really like this book and I do recommend this. Uh, I always read this blurb in the back because it's uh, from uh, Steve Donahue. So it's like one, one, a booktuber, you know, and he writes uh, terrific, a necessary addition to any Baker Street library. And I do agree. I think that anybody who is into Sherlock Holmes at all should have this book. There are other great books about Sherlock Holmes. Um, I have a book called The Great Detective. I'm trying to remember the name of the author. If I remember, I might put that in the box below not sure, um, which I read a few years back. I remember it because I was in Texas visiting my sister and I got a text from a friend of mine in uh, London who was really big into Sherlock Holmes, and uh, which is great, you know? <laughs> and uh, she recommended the book and we were going to Austin, Texas. So we, I went to Book People and that's the book I picked out. So it was like, yeah, I don't know, a nice memory of mine. And it has nothing to do with this book, but you know, Put a little of my own experiences in this in these things, right? Um, so I really liked the early part of the book, how 
yeah, how Conan Doyle came up with him and how he was, how he kept going, you know, during the life of, of Conan Doyle, how he tried to kill him basically and then brought him back. We, a lot of us who know anything about the story know that, that Arthur Conan Doyle had written other things. He was a doctor and um, so that works with a whole Watson perspective as a doctor. Um, but uh, yeah, he was definitely going to be making more money off his writing and he also wrote historical novels, he wrote other things and he wanted to concentrate on that and he just got tired of Sherlock Holmes, I guess. So he thought, I'll kill him off. You can't kill Sherlock Holmes, people want him back, so he, he had to bring him back in a slightly dramatic fashion and um, that is one of the most legendary things about him. But, and, and helps create an arch enemy, which helps create arch enemies to come, you know, and in, in future, in future fictional writings, every, every, I mean, even before Conan Doyle, but especially after that, every hero has to have an enemy, like a bad guy <laughs> that matches wits with him, you know, every Batman has his Joker, every Superman has his Lex Luthor. And I, I could probably go on, but my brain isn't working right now. <laughs> and I loved, I love the way the image changed, um, by the illustrators. I, I, I read the story before, but um, I don't know if I think the name is Paget. I don't know if it's pronounced Paget or Paget, usually, who knows. But there were two brothers that were both illustrators, right? Um, art, artists. And there was a, um, a, a letter, I guess, sent to their address requesting them to draw for um, illustrate the Sherlock Holmes stories. And the wrong brother got it. But he used his brother as a model for Sherlock Holmes. So that created the image of Sherlock Holmes. So it's, I don't know. I like these things. And, and it had a slightly, um, I forgot the name of the art, which artist he was living with, but it had a slightly pre raphaelite connection even then. I was like, my goodness, all, all my favorite things in one. But anyway, um, yeah, so he, I also like the fact that Conan Doyle did actually despite all his struggles with Sherlock Holmes, he did end up accepting him and defending him sometimes from different, um, uh, other people's versions of, of Sherlock Holmes. Some people were trying to, sometimes he was just trying to protect his finances, but also sometimes he just didn't like the way other people would take his character and try to make something into it that he didn't like. So that, that was the beginning. There are different, you know, different stories of people who were into Sherlock Holmes and what they did with it, how they, how they came to portray him in the future, how they came to organize later on to become the Baker Street Irregulars. All these different experiences, all these different people. Sometimes you, sometimes you think there was so many people involved, but it was good because you have to understand how Sherlock Holmes was a big deal back then and remained a big deal because he could have been someone who was kind of interesting and then just sort of died off and to be rediscovered here and there, but he remained important in fiction for so long and and even till now. Uh, then the period uh, approximately uh, about 50 years after um, Conan Doyle's death was probably not my favorite time to read about. Not saying all of it was bad, but it mostly focused on the sons of Conan Doyle. He had two sons, Dennis and Adrian. He had another one at least that died, but um, earlier. And uh, But these two brothers were... They led kind of extravagant lifestyles and they wanted to both protect their father's legacy, but also to profit from it. So they were kind of irritating, to be honest, to read about. So sometimes it was just like, even though sometimes they supported the fans, sometimes they supported other people's versions of them. If it went against something that they didn't like, it was just a constant struggle for anyone who wanted to keep Conan Doyle going. But that time period was important because it had the uh, Basil Rathbone, Nigel Bruce, Sherlock Holmes um, movies, which were very important. I, I watched some of them and we grew up watching some of them. But they were not, to me, they were not my definitive Sherlock Holmes. That's Jeremy Brett, which I'll get to in a moment. But, but I really, uh, but if it weren't for them, they probably, Sherlock Holmes as well, the image, you know, may not have, have lasted as much. Um, the one thing I'm not crazy about, there were so, you know, there were so many great people involved, like, um, 
like during the depression in the 30s in the United States there were radio shows about Sherlock Holmes that kept him going that was fascinating um there were um women who were protesting I guess in the 60s that they were not allowed into the Baker Street Irregulars even if they passed the famous test that you know of knowledge of Sherlock Holmes and the works and etc and they still couldn't get in so that was kind of obnoxious but um and also stories about certain pastiches that somehow made it through and got published, like The 7% Solution by Nicholas Meyer, which I promptly ordered, which I said I wasn't going to buy more books. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have one of his books called The West End Horror, which I still mean to read, so maybe I'll read that instead. While I wait, but no, I'm not starting any new books. We'll talk about that another time. Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness, so many books to read. But anyway, we're back, back to Sherlock, back to Sherlock. But... One of the things that this author did that I wasn't crazy about, that it wasn't horrible, but it was, he was trying to make this into, the description of the book calls it novelistic, so it, it, it try, it, he tries to um, make a story out of the existence of Sherlock Holmes and, and all the people behind Sherlock Holmes, which was great, but sometimes he overdid, and I mentioned this before in another video, he, he sometimes he did the thing where he introduced some person involved when they were younger or whatever and he make this whole like little did you know that this person is going to come back into the story later on and become this famous author and this famous person and it's like just tell me who it is just tell me I don't need this kind of mystery I know we like I like mystery but I don't need that I don't need to but I did like this one story and I'm not going to do a Michael Caine impression because I can't I know it's a common impression but I'm not going to do it if you want to do it then go ahead and do it on your own Okay. Chapter 92. Hello, hello, said Michael Caine to the elderly woman in the lift, very politely, as he always did when meeting her, going up or going down. It was late September 1988, and the well-known actor had recently moved to temporary lodgings in London's Chelsea after a long time in America. Hello, hello, he said again, next time they met. The woman replied in a similar polite manner, going up or going down. Caine had just filmed something called Without a Clue, starring Ben Kingsley as Dr. Watson, a doctor who not only solved crimes, but also wrote down his recollections. Watson had invented a fictional detective named Sherlock Holmes, and when people demanded to meet Holmes, he hired an alcoholic actor, Michael Caine, to play the role. It was a charming film, obviously written with lots of affection for Conan Doyle. Hello, hello, the woman was in the lift again, going down. You've played Sherlock Holmes, haven't you, she said. It was the first time they had got past the pure hello, hello exchange. Yes, I have, said Kane. The film would soon open at the cinemas. American newspaper men are going to come over here and interview you, aren't they? Yes, said Kane. One of them is going to interview me. Kane looked down at the old woman and gave her an understanding smile and thought, She's a bit dotty. And why would they be interviewing you, he asked. The woman looked at him. Because I am Conan Doyle's daughter. They had reached the ground floor and Dame, Dame Jean Conan Doyle walked out of the lift smiling, leaving Michael Caine behind. So that was kind of cute. Like it wasn't, you know, it was a little bit of a mysterious reveal, but it was quick. And I just like the story. I, I, I like, I can hear Michael Caine's voice in my head. I just can't do it. <laughs> I can't even do him saying hello, hello. I'm not going to humiliate myself, but I kind of want to see that film now. And that's the thing. Um, once it got into the eighties, once the two... Doyle, Conan Doyle sons died. Sorry, sorry. They were they were fascinating in a lot of ways. Um, one of them had a wife that was fascinating, and then when she married later, that was another interesting story. But um, but once once they died off, sadly, and um, Jean Conan Doyle actually Dean Jean Conan Doyle actually had a little more of the running, which wasn't her first choice, to be honest. I, I kind of preferred that. She was, I mean, she had certain things that she, certain opinions or whatever, but I feel like she was just a little more realistic. I don't know. I don't know what the word is. Um, but the 80s were interesting. They got into the Soviet Sherlock Holmes, which my friend from London uh, had just mentioned to me earlier this month. So um, there's a picture here. Um, can you see it? This is the, the um, let's see, uh, Vasily Livanov. Sorry, um, people, I don't pronounce it very well. And Vitaly Solomon in the Lend Film TV series. You got my, my favorites. And look, you got Jean Conan Doyle. There you go. Uh, it was really weird. Once, once she died, basically his direct heirs were gone. So then it went to nieces and nephews and that's how it is now, I think. Um, 
but yeah, so the 80s got into also, I didn't know about the Soviet um, interest in some British things. And apparently they have statues in Moscow of, of Sherlock Holmes and Watson that look like these actors, but that's fine, you know? Um, I, I don't know. I just, I like that. And, and then of course, Jeremy Brett, which in the Granada uh, production and how basically Sherlock Holmes took him over and it was sad. It, it was sad um, what happened to him when he died. And I found out it was, it was just, it was almost like losing a member of the family, kind of like with Alex Trebek, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, it happens. You just, and, and cause people who I watched with my family, it was, so, it was they were so important. Um, I would we would drink tea and watch Sherlock Holmes and I had friends over and I we had all the VHS you know tapes of of the mystery program with Sherlock Holmes and I'd have, make them tea and we watch Sherlock Holmes you know I don't change I don't change even in the 90s I didn't change but um I like that uh Jean Conan Doyle finally before she died was able to become a, a member of the uh Baker Street Irregulars the f I think it's the first female member I mean come on uh, it took it took long enough so uh and after all of that, they get into um, other other um, other books. Um, not, well, books, yeah. Mary Russell, which I didn't know. Apparently, I think it was her and my. I don't think I'm mistaken. I think it was her and also the uh, Seven Percent Solution, whatever. Um, that was written in fountain pen, uh, which, as a fountain pen enthusiast, made me excited. But I love the Mary Russells. I need to read another Mary Russell soon. Um, and. Uh, and also how Leslie, Leslie Klinger, I think the name was, I obviously wrote notes. You probably see me looking down. Um, I think it was him. He compiled with someone else whose name is escaping me. I should have written it down. Um, a couple of, uh, a compilation, a book that I also have. Um, that wasn't The Great Detective, was it? There, was, there were two books that I got around the same time. <laughs> oh boy. But um, maybe I'll, I'll have to remember to write them down below at some point. They, uh, just a compilation of different stories about Sherlock Holmes written by many different people. Some were a little far-fetched, some were really good, but it was a good collection, but the estate of Conan Doyle got, you know, had a whole issue with the second version. I don't know. And the whole, everything that went into litigations and everything, um, I kind of, I don't know, maybe, it, maybe, like, I don't necessarily think that Sherlock Holmes, they should do everything with him. Sometimes it's oversaturation, but I'm kind of like, at this point, just let people have fun with Sherlock Holmes, you know, and they have actually, the estate has actually sometimes approved certain, certain versions. Uh, Anthony Horowitz, who I mentioned here a number of times, did two Sherlock Holmes stories. One was House of Silk, I think, which was good, and Moriarty, which I do recommend. It's, it's different than, yeah, than what I expected, but I, I quite enjoyed it as well. And I'm thinking about that book again. I don't have it and I would like to look at it again. Um, but yeah, so again, this is a great story and it did. I feel like it led up to, even though they didn't discuss it at the end, but it led up to what now is what I call like the feminist reaction almost to Sherlock Holmes. I don't know if that's quite right, but I noticed that in recent years, even an episode of the Granada Sherlock Holmes had an episode with, um, feminists or suffragettes, whatever. Um, but it was just, it was a small part of one story, but, um, I know there's a lot of the new stories, the Mary Russell, she's very much of a feminist, the, um, Enola Holmes, which I haven't read the books, but saw the program, liked it. Henry Cavill, Sherlock Holmes is a stretch, but an enjoyable to watch stretch. Um, but also focused on feminism and, you know, women's rights, etc. Um, as did, I'm pretty sure other Oh yeah, the, um, that episode of Sherlock when they went back to Victorian times, the bride, the abominable bride. <laughs> oh man, I haven't seen that one in a while, but maybe I'll watch that later. But yeah, so um, I wonder, I wonder if that has to do because I don't necessarily think that. I mean, Sherlock Holmes himself had some trouble with women for some reason, which is interesting to explore. But you know, we get into Irene Adler as the woman etc. But I wonder if it was just because they were left out of the irregulars and other, and other, you know, fan groups that maybe they have a bit of a backlash now. I don't know. I don't know if it's a backlash or a reaction or just an inclusion now. I don't know. What do you guys think of that? I don't know. I keep saying I don't know because I don't know. But yes, aside from just not really enjoying the 
Conan Doyle's son's story uh, and a little bit of that yay and mysterious character uh, moments. I really did like this book and let me know if you've read this, what you think of it as well. Uh, always recommend anything related to Sherlock Holmes really, even if it's ridiculous. I'm, the, I'm like that. It's like just so enjoyable for me. So that's all for Tea and Mystery today. Hope you've enjoyed. If you like talking about tea and you like talking about mysteries, <laughs> please subscribe. This is Catherine taking tea with Catherine. Have a lovely tea and mystery filled day.